Hey guys, welcome to the 10th episode of the Mr. Atlanta podcast. My guest today, Thomas Harpointner. Thomas Harpointner. And why don't you tell everybody about yourself, Thomas? Uh, well, where do you want to start? Who are you? Where are you from? What do you do? Well, uh, I'm the CEO of AIS Media in Buckhead. We're a digital media and consulting firm. Um, been here for about 20 years. So prior to that, spent some time in Florida, Tennessee, grew up in New Jersey, originally from Germany. Um, moved here when I was about this tall. So, yeah. Uh, so recently. America, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, everybody loves America and Europe, you know, so, yeah, really get to, get to live the dream. Not everybody. Everyone I can remember, America was cool, you know, James Dean, blue jeans, white t-shirts, you know, <laughs> Every, everybody wanted Is to come that's to what's cool? States. That's what was cool, you know, it ages me a little, but, yeah, I mean, everyone in America wants to go to Europe and vacation there, you're like, ooh, you yeah. know, but, man, everyone I know wants to live in the States, so, Facts. yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're living our best life here, whether we know it or not. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Atlanta's like, I mean, it's a hotbed, you know? It's, it's basically New York of the South. Facts. Yeah, absolutely. Why do you feel that way? Well, you know, I've, uh, I've moved here in 97, so um, I've, I've had some time to, to figure that out, you know, when uh, there used to be a big sign on the downtown, you know, how many people lived here, you know, three million. I don't know where that sign is. Now. I remember that. P P on P Peach Street. Yeah, by the hospital. By, hospital, by you know? Piedmont Hospital. Like, every time I drive. Is it still there? You know, I don't know. I live in Buckhead now, so, you know, um, I, I haven't noticed Don't it, rough it down to Midtown often. I, yeah, right. Um, it's, it's a traffic that everyone complains about, but most of the complainers haven't lived in New York or L.A., you know, or Chicago for that matter. So, you know, for the rest of us, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a big deal. True. So, um, you know, I mean, what's not to love about Atlanta? You know, we've, we've, got, we've got a pretty big airport, right? Um, you can get anywhere in the country pretty much easily, you know, an hour, hour and a half back in New York, hour down in, you know, you're Miami, you can get to Dallas, I mean, it's the hub. 80% of America is within an hour and 30 minute flight of Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. So I was listening to a podcast hosted by Matt B. Davis called Atlanta Podcast. Uh -huh. There's another one called The Atlanta Podcast. This is the Mr. Atlanta Podcast. Um, Not to be confused with. Yeah, pod, 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 pod. <laughs> right, yeah. So he just had this guy named Carl Atkins on. Do you know who that is? Don't know Carl Atkins. I heard of the Atkins diet, but, you know, right, different right. Atkins. Cause so he's gone. Carl Atkins was a part of the 1996 Olympic Committee okay. to host the games here in Atlanta. Right on. He also right. helped with the 2000 Super Bowl and then most recently the 2018 mm -hmm. Super Bowl. That we host, was that last year? It was last yeah. year. Uh, those jets flew right over, man. It was, it was, that was a moment. That was, right. a, it was, a, it was an amazing moment. What do you yeah. mean? Uh, it would have been the cheapest to ever go to the Super Bowl, right, if you're in Atlanta. Right. And um, I had friends that went down. I decided not to. I hosted a party at my place. And uh, we heard this rumbling. Like, you know, it sounded like freight trains, right? Um, yeah, right off of Peachtree, we're always hearing stuff, right? It was a rumbling, it shook the building, and everyone ran from the living room, and, and we heard these jets just rolling down from Dalvid's Air Force Base, and I just couldn't pull out my iPhone fast enough. So I got them in the distance, but man, it, every, every, everything got quiet. We're like, oh my God, you know what I mean? It's a once in a lifetime thing you're gonna see. Uh, you know, they're rolling down, you know where they're going, they're going towards the stadium. And, um, you know, when you watch TV, there's a bit of a delay, you know, so we all rushed back to the TV and sure enough, you know, they were coming. But how often do you see something wow. like that, right? And then, of course, they circled around and, and came back, you know, and said, hey, let's, let's catch them this way. Uh, and we realized, you know, it, it's those particular moments in time that, you know, you don't expect and, until they just pass you by, literally like, you know, it was... F-15s flew by and realized, you know, this is a pretty big deal here, you know, like the, the whole country is watching, 120 million people are watching this game today, you know. Uh, it, it, I, I, I got on, you know, Fox Business a few times talking about the Super Bowl and advertising, is it worth it to drop five million bucks for 30 second spot, you know, some say yes, others say no. Um, but, you know, it's real, you know, I mean, it's, F-15s are flying by, and then you see them on a big screen along with 100, other, you know, 120 million people. 
like man, you know, we're 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 at the middle of something big right now, and it's you know, it's our it's it's my home, it's our town. You know, you know how Gary Vee feels about Super Bowl <laughs> advertisements. I, I you know, I've heard him uh, express his feelings about a lot of things. Yeah, not not on that topic. He thinks uh, television advertising is the past. It's fucked. Not a place to ever advertise, except for the Super Bowl. He says that's the biggest. How oh, else do you reach 120 million people in one shot? There's nothing you know, in the world. Of course, that doesn't get into production costs and, and other stuff, and the fact that most Super Bowl commercials are never remembered because, you know... What kind of too, impression did they actually Well, I mean, they get too caught up in the animation, the CGI, just like a lot of movies these days, mm -hmm. you know, so kind of lose the message. But we all have favorites, right? Say, Doritos. I mean, they're rock stars. So they, they, they put probably right, the yeah. most effort into their Super Bowl commercials. And they get it right. And, well, they also yeah. get other people to make it for them. Right. To do the videos. I have, I knew you were going to say Doritos. I have a buddy <laughs> who did the Doritos. Yeah. Challenge Javier McIntosh. Yeah. And, yeah, I think he did well. Yeah. No, it's... No, but it, so it, back to what I was saying it. about Carl Atkins mm -hmm. is we're slated to have some of the biggest events in the world in this city for the next five to 20 years. We have MLS championship coming up. Mm -hmm. The well, what about all the films that are shot in our backyards every single day? Very true. You know, Lots a good friend films. of mine owns a casting company. We help her cast for various roles. I've gotten twelve friends in the last, you know, couple months on on you know major films. Not not bragging here. It's just that the demand is so high. I mean, she owns a casting company, runs it full time. One of the most successful ones in Atlanta. And there's still more demand than supply, you know? Um, the Mel Gibson film recently, uh, you know, Selma, uh, Selma Blair film, and, you know, Marvel, uh, Walking Dead, I mean, it just goes on and on and on every single day. 23 counties in Georgia are set up, you know, for, for production. So, uh, you know, it's, that's phenomenal. I mean, who would have guessed that 10 years ago? When I moved here, I mean, that wasn't even a blip. You know, it was Tyler Perry it. and Leah were doing some music videos and stuff, but I mean, who would have thought Atlanta was going to be the Hollywood of the East Coast? And in some ways, better, I think. I you know. definitely think Atlanta's the best city in the world, in my opinion. And I've biked across America twice from yeah. San Fran to DC. I've lived in Medellin, Colombia, in Spain. Spent time in Germany, I lived in South Korea, been to Panama, mm -hmm. South America, and this city has more opportunity, beauty, and love yeah. than any other city in the it's world, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, there's lots of love, yeah. Uh, it depends on what you look for, right? Like, you know, we, you know, we see things not as they are, but as we are, I think is a famous quote. Facts. Um, so, yeah, you know, if you wake up in the morning, um, you know, go through a short list of things that you're grateful for, advantages that you have. I mean, it just set, it sets you up for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wake up in the morning and you start thinking about things that didn't go your way the last few days and start to mill on that, you know, then it'll also be, you know, that'll be your day. It's a choice. Um, but man, of all the places that you can live, regardless of what you want to do and what industry you want to be in, uh, there's an opportunity for that here. And uh, not just an opportunity, but so many. So right? many. So if you're digital media, uh, film, music, uh, you know, you're going to be in corporate America, uh, startups. I mean, we got Atlanta Tech Village around the corner from us, and, and many other you know little hot, hot spots. I mean, there's something going on every single night. There's something going on, no matter what your interest is, right? There's there's absolutely no reason to uh, be down on yourself, right. you know, and, and sit on the sofa, you know, as a couch potato and say, oh, I wish, you know, maybe one day my ship will come in. You gotta go out and get it, but it's here. It's right in our backyard. So, uh, yeah, really, you know, there's a lot to be grateful for, in my opinion. You gotta go out and get it. Oh, yeah, out here absolutely. In yeah. If you don't, somebody else will. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's for sure. But uh, it, it's, it, in some ways, it's a lot easier, you know. I've spent time, you probably have too, in New York, and it, it's still a big apple. I love New York City. So many things to love about it. Um, but it's, it's not as personable. Not know? even close. No. Um, you know, certainly there are a lot of things that, that, you know, New York has that Atlanta doesn't because it's been around a lot longer. But, you know, here you can go out any night of the week, you know, 
last night's spur a moment, I was invited by a friend of mine. She's a producer at CNN. There was a you know a Atlanta Press Club meeting. You know where all these producers from all Where over the was world. That? Uh, Brookhaven. Was it Brookhaven? Brookhaven. Yeah. What? Um, chop shop. Really? Yeah. Um, like a view. Looked like they're on a roof or something. God, yeah. It was a back, it was a back cover patio. But these producers are here from all over the world. You know, like Turkey and uh, Colombia and and Brazil, and they're they're doing a U.S. tour and and like. Who am I in the middle of here? You know, I mean, some really, really influential people, and uh, yeah, that was happening. And you know, yeah, you know, buddy from Germany, you know, and uh, Finland, like everyone in one room, you know, and they're kind of moving, you know, they're going to finish the tour, I think, on the West Coast, you know, in about a week. Like, yeah, but you know, CNN, it's downtown, you know, it's in our backyard. Uh, it's it's the center of the universe. Ted Turner. So, yeah. So, it, it, you know, sometimes we, it's so easy, you know, to take things for granted, you know, and say, oh yeah, you know, here's CNN, you know, uh, here's, you know, Coca-Cola headquarters and, you know, yeah, no, you know, we just live in the middle of it. You know. One of the biggest ways for me to consistently capitalize on that, at least in the past few months, has been getting a new Apple Watch and having the 10,000 step accountability tracker. Yeah. Just as simple as getting... 10,000 steps a day and doing what you have to do to get outside and get those fucking steps. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've been here since 07 myself, and it's nice to have some kind of accountability or purpose to consistently get out and get it. Because you can work out and, and get steps or not. Oh, Just sure. Just do yeah. weights, this yeah, and that, yeah, yeah, but yeah. you won't be your healthiest self, your best yeah. self. So for me, it's getting those steps, getting out into the city on the weekends, at, in the evenings, and going to these events. Yeah, great I actually point. spent um, a few hours last week going through 30 of the top calendars in Atlanta. Google calendars, every type of... I mean, it's, and it's pulling all crazy, the right? events that I want right. to go to, and there's so many, I'm pretty yeah, much yeah. slated through right. January. Yeah. I mean, it, it can seem it can seem a little overwhelming, right? But uh, you do need to narrow your focus, decide you know where your interest level is, and you know it helps to. Uh, I found it helps to make friends in that way. You know, um, like we work with some travel companies, you know, and uh, a big trend I found was you know I think like twenty thirty percent of people have traveled by themselves somewhere and enjoy it because they find it less stressful. So because wherever you go, if you want to go to Barcelona, guess what? You're going to run into people who are traveling to Barcelona, right? A little bit easier than rallying a bunch of friends to say, hey, let's go on a Barcelona trip. So just go where you want to go and connect with people that are already there. And I think the same thing is true in, you know, in Atlanta or you know, if you want to uh, start a business or you're in a, in a, in a, certain, you know, a certain interest, uh, just get up and go. You know, don't wait for the invite. Don't wait for two other friends to go with you. Just go there, and you're probably going to start running into people uh, that you know. And if not, at least you share a common interest, right? Yeah. It, it kind of gets over that. Simple as that. Um, just go, too. Just, just, just Fuck be the there, invite. You know? Just go. Be there. And, uh, I can't tell and, you how many times I've been You're welcome, places. right? And people, yeah. people are open. They're friendly. And they're like, hey, so, so glad you came. You know, right. in some ways, they're happier that you came than you are that you're there. You know, they want people there. And you didn't even buy a ticket. <laughs> you just showed up. Just showed up, man. And uh, people are happy to see you. You know, uh, that's 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 definitely one thing to love. And a lot of people that first move here, they don't know how to take the city. They don't know how to take the people, because most people, let's be honest, are from somewhere else. I, it, it's it's more rare to meet someone who was born and raised in Atlanta has been my opinion, you know, like, at least in the like city. I am. But yeah, I mean, you're, you're one of those guys, right? And you're here, right? But if I say, hey, where were... To be specific, I was born in Gwinnett, grew up in Gainesville, and moved to downtown. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, that's way out so, there. You know, it's not even Atlanta anymore, right? That's it's not. Way. It's not at all. <laughs> so, I mean, Atlanta, born and bred, Georgia, yeah. more or yeah. less. But been hustling right. in downtown Georgia State since 18. So You've traveled like, a bit. You've seen the Oh, world, yeah, I've places, been all but... around the world, and have very happily come back to the city, yeah. to Atlanta. Yeah. Oh, I mean, there are people, you know, they they're born in the house, went to the neighborhood school, never left the county, been there their whole life. So it's hard to try to imagine a world outside of that circle. Fact. So it's helpful to, you know, 
go to some meetups, you know, do a little traveling, you know, s spread your wings a bit, you know, exp you know expand your mind, um, educate yourself on other cultures and other points of view, and um, you know, you'll find that the more places you visit, the more people you meet. First of all, we're all minorities, right? It's just it's it's all situational, um, and, and then you'll you know it's humbling. Now, if you're in New York City, let's say you're in Miami, it's very international. Um, no one fits in, therefore everyone fits in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and you know it's humbling at that point to realize you know we really as people have a lot more in common than we don't, right? It, some people just like to focus on that one thing that we disagree on. You know, um, that's really a waste of time, waste of effort. So, so what do you like to do for fun? Well, this is fun. I agree. I'm having a great time, man. This is great. Thanks for the invite. Um, yeah, you know, it, it depends. Uh, I'm a workaholic. Uh, I own my own company, so you know, if you love what you do, you, you know, you never work a day in your life, as the saying goes, or you're always working, right? Um, but I'm very fortunate to be in a business, digital media, digital marketing. Social media. We work with so many brands, so, so many different types of companies in different industries. There's always something going on, whether it's in motorsports or healthcare, life science. Um, I've worked with nonprofits uh, ever since I moved to Atlanta. It's how I made my first friends. You know, it's, it's easy to make friends, by the way, if you just go do some charity work, because people are begging you to be there. They're grateful that you came. You know, and they'll do everything they can uh, to get you to come back. So, uh, you know, I think the first charity I worked with was the Boys and Girls Clubs. You know, they were, I mean, that's, that's an amazing group. The first one I did. Is that right? Seven, I was a mentor wow. for okay. the Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Atlanta. All right, beautiful. Yeah, uh, Vander Holyfield Foundation. Uh, we, you know, we helped uh, organize and promote the annual, annual gala when the hotel in Bucket was the Swiss Hotel, you know. So Hell yeah. It was a while ago, but, um, you know, hearing those stories and the effect it has on kids, you know, as a, as a safe haven. You know, an after-school place to go where they can learn, get strong, you know, make good friends. Like, man, that needs to be protected, right? right. So of all the causes people can care about... Um, a safe and, and, for kids? Well, it's more I mean, important than that. I mean, that's the future, right? That's it. So, um, you know, we were there once, you know, and there were certainly times... I've, I've Probably everyone at some point in their life felt bullied or unsafe. And to have a place to go, you know, is, is uh, I think, very valuable. So... Uh, charity work has always been a passion, and uh, it, it, not just because I'm charitable. I mean, part of it is selfish. You know, it's I get satisfaction from helping people, from being able to see, you know, the impact that's being made. You know, to, to help kids. I mean, maybe it sounds a little cheesy, but you know, it's like, oh, you know, if you can save, change one kid's life. You know, we, we've heard that on TV, but man, it's uh, it, it's it's actually true. You know, so the uh, impact that you get from helping one person or giving one thing, I couldn't agree more. It feels kind of selfish. It feels a little bit like, whoa. It almost does. I didn't know giving yeah. was this giving. <laughs> right, I, you know, I feel like I'm stealing, <laughs> you know, that they're so happy. I'm like, wait, I had a great time, <laughs> you know? I'm afraid I may have had a better time than you, but. Um, yeah, so people should do that, you know, they should do more of it and find the time to, um, because at some point all of us need help. You just, sometimes we need help at the worst moment, you know? And to be able to make, uh, to be able to have some friends that you met in those type of, you know, circumstances who are also volunteers from different walks of life, um, you know, on a short dial. You know, you can just call them, text them. Um, I mean, we get into crunch time all the time at my company. I mean, you know, if sometimes things get super busy. I'm like, oh man, you know, I need a killer graphic designer. Who do I know? Um, Somebody didn't come through, you know, our vendor dropped the ball and you know, just go through that Rolodex or post something on Facebook and say, hey, you know, we're doing this charity event. We need some volunteers who would be willing and able to help out. Who wants to donate? And, you know, it, show, it doesn't happen overnight. Right. But if you, you know, if you build that kind of network and you get to know people at that level, you know, you're giving, they're giving back um, from all different walks of life. You, you're going to meet people that you would never ever meet in other circumstances. Because, you know, we all have our close friends that we go hang out with, you know, we talk about the same stuff. But once you get involved in community events, uh, charity events, social activities, I mean, you got people that, you know, you might not be a total techie, you know, a geek, but you're gonna, you're gonna meet those kind of guys, right? Um, you're gonna meet women in healthcare, you're gonna meet, you know, college professors, um, you know, 
buddy of mine, he works for the FBI downtown, you know? Like, how would I have met this guy? It's my roommate, Aaron. Hey, hey how's it going? Kind of sneak by. Thomas, yeah, I know. Go right ahead. Good looking haircut, bro. Thanks, appreciate it. Alright, you, yeah. you guys you guys, look great as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Black and white, I love it. You guys <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was entirely not planned. You guys equal each other out. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, 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 right on. Like this. Thanks, bro. Good observation. <laughs> it didn't occur to me. Say it's a perspective. Yeah, it truly he is zoomed perspective. Out. He zoomed out. He it's like zoomed from, out. A, from a distance, he said, hey, look at this. Look at this, look at this yin and yang. Yeah, yeah I've been kind of on a white kick lately. Um, it's white clothes. Yeah. And I'll go ahead and share with my listeners why. First off, white expands your aura. Your natural presence right. is going to be 5 to 10 feet. White's going to make it 15 feet, 18 feet. People are going to feel you and your energy that much further out. Secondly, mm -hmm. it's really hard to keep clean. So if you can keep white and decent presentation, it looks like you're wearing a level of clothes that, you know, these are from Goodwill. This is probably $4 worth of clothes. So what does it say to you about people who gravitate towards the darker colors like black? Well, see, it goes both ways. And lastly, with the white, it keeps negative energy and feelings kind of bounce from you. Does it? In two different ways, from both people saying it, mm -hmm. because you're white, the color's white, they're not trying to bounce as much bad thoughts and energy from that. And secondly, just not saying it. Mm -hmm. um, but in the inverse of black, it kind of goes the other way in, in all senses, except when you combine them. So you put like a black accent with the white or white with the black, you can get a lot. And it's good to balance it out. So I don't always do all white always. If I'm doing my podcast, something I'm very happy and jovial about, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna wear the white. But if I'm going somewhere I don't care as much about, I'm not. And that's where I am at 31 years old in my fashion exploration. So hey, you know, by, you know, my stage, we're gonna put a black curtain up and you're gonna stand out. You're gonna contrast against the black curtain with your white shirt and I'll just blend it. I'll just be a talking head. That's true. You know. I have a black curtain too. Right on, okay. All right. So what makes you an expert in your industry? I'm probably the least qualified person to answer that question. You know, um, makes me an expert. I think the more you learn in life, the more you discover how little you actually know. Facts. And um, you, you can always tell an ignorant person because they know it all. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's usually the quietest person in a room, you know, that, you know, sometimes knows the most or is a complete moron until he opens his mouth. Um, but, you know, what makes you an expert, I, uh, it's been proven, you know, I mean, Einstein's theory, uh, it takes 10,000 hours at anything for anyone pretty much become an expert in a particular topic. Right. You know, if you wanted to become an expert you know, uh, music librarian, okay? If you started today, 10,000 hours from now, whether you burn those hours over 10 years or a couple of years, or how, you know, hey, whatever. You know. What are you putting your 10,000 towards? You, you know, mine, mine are kind of spread out, you know, so uh, it, it's, it, you know, it's a balance. So it also, with me, it always, it all starts with health, right? Health is wealth. So, Keeping a, you know, keeping my mind and my body as healthy as possible. That's part of that goal of living my best life, right? Um, so my definition of wealth is ultimately happiness, because that's the end goal, in my opinion, that most people work towards anyway, right? I have a couple of younger nieces. Uh, they're, they're starting high school, and you know, we have these conversations. You know, what do you, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? You know, that kind of thing. They don't know. Um, but everything they're describing really describes, you know, what makes them happy, situations where they're happy. Um, you know, why do people want to make more money? So they can do more of the things that make them happy, ultimately. I mean, we're seeking happiness, right? So, are you happy or are you more or less happy when you're, ha when you're sick or when you're healthy, right? I think sickness, unless, you know, it's a, maybe, you know, some people like a cold. But most of us are less happy when we're run down, when we're tired, when we're not feeling ourselves, right? So we're trying to get back to that level. So definitely, you know, keeping healthy is part of that balance, right? Uh, 
you know, is money going to make you happy, more or less of it? Well, uh, you know, I think it's different for different people. You know, if you grow up in poverty, then you're obsessed with pulling yourself out of that level. Um, and, and certainly a certain degree of financial success, or I'd say financial security, is probably more important, right? Feeling financially secure where, you know, you're not struggling every day. You know, you're not struggling for that next paycheck. You're not worried about, hey, you know, your light's going to get shut off, the car's going to get repoed. I mean, if you're obsessed with those thoughts, it's hard then to step back, be creative, and say, hey, you know, create, uh, create something from nothing, create a charity, create a company. It's hard to do that, you know, when, when the threat of your life, you know, where there's threat of your livelihood. So financial security, I believe, should be, I mean, for me at least, it's a, it's a, it's a measure of success, right? Just not having to worry about your finances. That's great. You know, it means you should always respect money, you should be in touch with it, but um, always keeping a certain level of financial security, don't sacrifice that, right? So you can focus more on the things you like to do and less of the things that you're doing just for money. Um, I, I think Jerry Seinfeld uh, once said that, you know, the only thing good about being rich is not worrying about money, but you're going to still have a lot of problems, you know. It doesn't get rid of all your problems. Um, so, but yeah. Is money the root of all evil? I'm like, well, there's probably more evil because of a lack of money than the excess of it, right? Um, but you know, it's it's a balance. And then, you know, if you love your work, you never work a day in your life. So find something you're passionate about. Figure out how to be financially secure doing that thing, uh, especially if it helps other people. You know, if it only helps yourself, you're probably not going to be very successful because, you know, every every successful company on on the planet does something for other people, not just for itself, right? Um, so you have to be thoughtful of the, you know, the environment that we live in, the people, you know, our neighborhood, our world. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, a, you know, it's a unique combination for people. I think that changes as you mature, you get older, um, you know, your priorities begin to shift. Um, so, but, you know, when, when you're 20, it's hard to imagine life, you know, when you're 40, when you're 40, you're like, man, that blew by fast. Right. Whoa. You know? I better so let's talk about your benefit that's coming out. My benefit, sure. Well, you know, coincidentally, coincidentally, look at what I brought. Ooh. Uh, I brought a little right. four by six. It's the, um, it's the bubbles benefit. And it's really interesting. I, you know, I'll keep the story short, but this did not, this was nothing a few months ago. It didn't exist. It wasn't even a thought. Uh, you know, it's not something we've been planning, not a whole lot of strategy went into it, you know, over the summer. But, you know, a few friends and I got together. We, we've done charity events, we've done mixers, you know, a lot of a lot of my friends, they know us from the hump day mixers at, on Wednesdays and so forth, we've done over the last few years. But we wanted to do something a little bit um, more mature, you know, something a little bit more upscale than just, you know, the regular bar scene. And uh, a friend of mine, his wife, uh, you know, she's a, uh, she has a master's in interior design. She works at Roche Beauvoir, very high-end luxury furniture store in Buckhead. Global Roche company. Beauvoir? Roche Beauvoir, because it's French. Beauvoir. Beauvoir. Roche Beauvoir. So B-O-B in French is a B-O-V. B-O-B-I-O-S. Roche Roche Beauvoir. 333 Buckhead Avenue. A little plug there. You're welcome, Victor. Um... Um, well, you know, they came to our office a few months ago. We're exploring digital marketing strategy, maybe how we can leverage social media. It's something they have they've tried and you know been sporadically successful at over the years. And I go, well, I how could we help you? I don't know. You know, um, kind of put that on the shelf. Sometimes you know ideas don't just happen overnight. So we put that idea on the shelf. Um, and then you know, one day uh, met. Uh, you know, something just inspired me to do this Facebook post. I'd have to go back to my timeline. You can pull it up. Um, it says, you know, thinking about doing, you know, a charity event or something like that. And um, name your favorite charity in Atlanta. I, I just wanted friends to tell me I think what I was remember important that to them. Because you messaged me a little after. Yes. He was so passionate and, and he was part of the, uh, the organization. He was the founder and the CEO on the front lines and it really inspired me. I'm like, you know what? This is the kind of guy who's gonna help me help him, right? right? Um, which is very important to make anything successful. You need a lot of people working towards a common cause to bring you know, unique skill sets you know, to the table. 
uh, like, you know, l l let's see what he's all about. I messaged him, man. Within a couple of days, he was at my office. Um, we sat down, we, you know, we had a half hour scheduled, but I, I think we ended up meeting for about 90 minutes and we had so much in common. Um, such an incredibly passionate guy. I said, you know what? I gotta help him out. You know, I gotta say, what, what can we do? You know, we're a marketing company. We've worked with, with hospitals, work with charities, work with children's health care. Fantastic organization. But they're a huge company, right? I mean, Chick fil A, children's health care every year. Very successful campaign. Uh, he's not, yeah, he's much smaller, right? A, a smaller group. So, you know, I think we might be able to make an impact. And, and then I remembered, oh, this Roche Beauvoir thing, you know, they need help. And, so suddenly it materialized. It just started coming together. And um, I didn't have a name for it. Like, I don't know, you know? It's gonna be at a high-end high store. They're willing to give us their venue because they want foot traffic, they want brand awareness. What do we call this thing? I'm like, you know what? I asked people what they cared about. Let me ask them again. Uh, we came up with a few quick names at my office. You know, we passed it around. and um, but, So I, I gave the Facebook friends three options, you know, to choose from. Uh, messaged a couple hundred people and said, hey, you know, we value your opinion. What do you think? Just, you know, give me a quick vote. And overwhelmingly, they picked uh, Bubbles Benefit because we're going to be serving champagne. It's going to be a classy event. It's upscale, uh, red carpet, limousines, open rooftop patio. Everyone's donating everything pretty much, you know, live, live band. They're playing for free, DJ. Um, you know, he's donating his services, uh, you know, Patrick, you know, you, you go to the web page, you go to our web page, you'll see all the people that are donating all of their services. Pretty amazing. Uh, Just on this, I see, you know. You'll see a few, yeah. Roche, uh, Bouvet. Bouvoir. Right? Bouvoir. Bouvoir, you know. There was uh, a charity. Hands, hands Across, across Atlanta. Atlanta. You got Chucky Photo down there. Right? Chucky Photo uh, along with York. Dylan I mean, York. knows these guys, right? Everybody knows them. I've worked for Chucky Photo. Yeah. YP of Atlanta. I saw you there at the party a couple months ago. Yeah. AS Media, you guys. And yeah. then Telplus. Telplus Travel. Telplus yeah, Travel. It's a corporate travel agency here in Atlanta. A uh, good friend. And, um, you know, they're kicking in what they can to help give them a success. What do they do? They're a corporate travel company, you know. So if you're a corporation and you want to, you need trips booked, and you got a lot of executives flying around, those are your guys. At quarter of a billion dollar company headquartered right in our backyard. Um, so, you know, good to have them on board. Um, good to have other local, you know, companies all pitching in, helping out. Um, event planner, you know, Kelly Darwin. I mean, she's executive assistant at a huge company. I don't know how she's finding time to help us, but I'm incredibly grateful. Um, you know, it's just folks from all different walks of life, you know, that have full-time jobs. Um, you take Caitlin Elizabeth, uh, you know, on Facebook, right? I mean, she's a perfusionist at Piedmont Hospital, open heart surgery, but she's finding time to help out. Um, I mean, I, I can just go down the list, you know? So that's incredibly moving to me, and I thought, well, we gotta make this a success. We said, what's, what's your favorite name for the event? Everyone's like, oh, Bubbles Benefit, because it's for a children's charity. Um, you know, let's, uh, let's go with something fun. So we did. October 2nd, 6 p.m., 333 Buckhead Avenue. Yeah. 30305. We'll see y'all there. Yeah, $25 is a donation, tax deductible, or VIP is 50 bucks and you get 10 free raffle tickets. Uh, we're pretty much sold out, you know, but I'd say if anyone still wants to come, they need to grab their tickets pretty quick. Oh, wow. Because capacity is the only issue. What's capacity? You know, uh, you know Victor tells me, you know, maybe three to four hundred people max, but the store has furniture in it. You know, so uh, yeah, a few hundred comfortably. We're probably going to open the rooftop. I, I think the weather's going to hold up, so we'll be able to open the rooftop. Uh, yeah, we're. I mean, we're. It's right there in the little Spanx, like gypsy kitchen. Well, it's a little bit up the street from that. It's it's a it's a two minute walk from Fado's. So the other. Okay, way, over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like yeah, you're heading the other way. So if I'm passing Fado on my right. For those on your right, and you just keep going. A little bit more. A little, little bit more, and uh, uh, you'll see Roche Beauvoir on the on right. right. On the right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun, you know. But that's, you ask me, what do I do for fun? I mean, to me, that's fun. Of course. You know, it's an excuse to reach out to people, invite them out, let's have a good time, let's take some awesome photos, um, you know, get people online, you know, supporting a good cause, get them to mix and mingle, make some new friends as we did. Um, yeah, you never know where it's going to go. So we have some big plans for this, and 
uh, it, again, I, I mean, I can't be more grateful for all these folks that are just reaching out. Many of them completely unsolicited. Uh, you know, local gyms. You know, someone's donating a hundred dollar gift card from Saks. Um, you know, Rebecca Camille. She's opening a boutique, her own business, so she wants to kick in a hundred dollar, hundred fifty dollar uh, gift card. Uh, uh, bring it home yoga studio. They're in Buckhead. They're donating hundred eighty five dollars worth of. Uh, gifts, you know, Jeez, uh, well. yoga classes and stuff. We've got Empress Elite Limousine, one of our clients, also a very good friend. Uh, and she met us at one of these events a few years ago, you know, so we became very good friends and a client. But she's donating $500 uh, in limousine services, you know, in her stretch limo. We're, we're going to raffle all of these off, by the way, you know, so $10 raffle gift cards can win you those and many other types of prizes. So that's really, really cool. And the money that we raise from the raffle tickets go directly to Marcus Acosta's charity, Hands Across Atlanta. And, and they're there, and they're volunteering, and they're selling those tickets that night. And, uh, you know, it, it, just all around. I mean, what more can you want, right? Nothing. Yeah. I mean, when you got people like you and Marcus and Byron Cooper. Oh, yeah. People yeah. involved with, with this, right. spreading the word. Yeah, it's going to be organic, yeah, but it's take, also a lot of hustle. Well, you take you know, someone like Patrick Thompson, who a few weeks ago I didn't even know. I met him at Young Professionals of Atlanta, really awesome group, you know, run by Jordan uh, Thompson, and he invited me out one day. And here I meet this guy, Patrick, and, you know, we just hit it off, I and mean, he's just a cool guy, you know, personality, kind of like you, you know? I've met him. Um, Thank you. But he might have a little bit on you. Uh, <laughs> he's like, um, yeah, he, he's like your polar opposite, right? He's a Georgia state trooper, and he owns his entertainment company as a side hustle. Like, if you're going to be pulled over by someone, let, uh, you know, I hope it was I hope him. It's him. Um, DJ services, security, no surprise there, right? Um, and he's providing this incredible six-foot-tall digital interactive photo booth. You know, the kind you walk up to, it's a mirror, it's a giant selfie light, it talks to you, you can see yourself, countdown, smile. And, and you can print the pictures out. Huge. Man, how awesome is that? I hate going to events and having to wait three weeks for pictures, you know? Oh, I know. Um, Some kind of digital... He's, he's donating all of these services, right? All of this stuff. Just-in-time entertainment, right? Um, so, are we going to use him for corporate events? Am I going to recommend them to clients? I mean, you bet I will. You know, because who does that? Everyone else wants to make, a, make money, and, and I get it. You know, I mean, I do too. You know, I, my company's not a nonprofit. But, you know, sometimes you got to give a little to get a little. And I really, really appreciate people who understand that, you know, who get it. You know, you got to give, give a little to get a little, right? Pay it forward. So all these folks that are kicking in and donating prizes and donating services, um, our event planner, Kelly Darwin, she said, hey, you know, by the way, my brother's, a, you know, he's, he's security. You know, he's pretty, uh, you know, pretty hard-ass guy. Um, but he's willing to donate his services, you know, help work the front door and keep the place civil. Like, I mean, that's amazing, you know? I mean, it's going to be really crazy. All these people there might get in a fight. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I'm kidding. Well, no, I mean, it could. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know, you know? So, yeah, I mean, it's good to have security. I don't think it'll be that kind of clientele. Um, our patrons. You never know. It's usually the girls that start the trouble, it has been my experience. But, I mean, look, you know, every dollar. Uh, that people donate in time, right? You could pay a security guy or someone else a hundred bucks, but every dollar that you that, that the guy is willing to not accept goes directly to Hands Across Atlanta, and it, it, it's buying school supplies for underprivileged kids. And when you think about that, you know, I, I remember when I was in the fourth grade, I grew up in New Jersey, and we had four Apple computers in the classroom, you know, and. Uh, you know, I was born in Germany, you know, so when I first moved to the States, I didn't speak a word of English, right? So to most kids in there, I was like half, you know, I was half slow, you know, because I didn't speak much. I was pretty shy. Um, still am, by the way. It's very intimidating. Oh, I can tell. Um, th this is all an act, you know. This is all an act. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we had four computers in the classroom, you know, so the smart kids, the popular kids were always on the computer, you know, the bright kids. and. So I didn't get exposed. I, I, there was no computer time for me, you know, and, and that would have been really nice, you know, to, to play with a Mac. And um, 
you know, if we can do, if, if we can give more kids an opportunity to do that, right, to give them the supplies that they need, the tools that they need, man, you don't know where the next Einstein's going to come from, you know? Um, who's going to change the world? Who's going to save the planet, right? Who's going to come up with that great idea, the next great musician, the next greatest artist? We don't know where that's going to come from. Um, you know, we, we can just go to the Apple store and buy this thing. Uh, you know, a 10-year-old can't do that. 14-year-old can't do that, you know? And if the parents aren't equipped, then where is it going to come from? So to me, that's an extremely worthwhile cause, something that, you know, I intend to support for a very, very long time, as long as I can. Um, and I hope that a lot of other people will as well. Yeah. How do you like that, by the way? You know, it's all over the news this week. Did you hear about that? It's what, still not a real one. You see, you, what, you see, yeah, I'm CNBC, very, you know, I'm very the, yeah, I don't watch yeah, any of those. I listen, see, yeah, I listen to The Economist. Stuff, yeah. okay. Are you familiar with The Economist? I, I've heard Magazine. of The Economist, yeah. It's a weekly publication that comes out uh -huh. of Britain. Right. And it's the most unbiased source of news in the world, period. I've been reading it for like 15 years. And so, yeah, they give me pretty unbiased news about what's happening. Sure, six fucking people died from vape cigarettes. How many people die per minute from real cigarettes? That's it. That's still, as long as we're enabling people to get off of cigs. So. I don't know. I, jury's still out. I, I lost my brother to lung cancer. He was 32. He was smoking since he was 13. Wow. And um, it, it, it was absolutely terrifying. You know. So, I mean, to me, talking about health is wealth, you know, I saw that, you know, and, and he left two young girls behind. So, you know, I, I mean, to me, who knows? You know, some people, and they smoke every day, you know, they eat bacon every day, they live in extremely unhealthy lives, and they're 94. Uh, you know, who knows? What's your diet like? My diet, man. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't call myself, you know, a hardcore health food, you know, freak, because there, there is this emotional struggle between I want six pack abs, but I love pizza. <laughs> so, you know, every, occasionally the pizza has to win out, you know what I mean? But um, since you bring it up, I, you know, I've, I've worked out, you know, two, three days a week, sometimes more. But in doing more of this stuff, and uh, especially this time of year, you know, skipping those gyms at night, you know, those gym sessions at night, I said, you know, I'm gonna have to challenge myself to start going in the mornings. And that's, that's tough, right? Because I, to me, that's half the workout, just getting up and getting dressed and going there. Once you're there, you're gonna work out. And um, but it's one thing I can say, I'm proud of myself I've been able to do recently, you know, just hitting the gym just about every morning, you know, getting in there at, you know, getting up at 5.30, um, having a, a, a good shake, you know, blueberries, protein powder, you know, a little spirulina, um, you know, some good stuff to get the energy level up and going, getting a good one hour workout in, and man, it, it, it makes a difference. It makes a difference in a day. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, if you have all of these other open items that you haven't been able to accomplish, you know, sometimes some days are more productive than others, right? At least that's one thing you can scratch off and say, you know what? I got my workout in. I feel good, you know? I feel good. I invested in um, my health I, for I, the future. I did that. That's, you know, I did that it. because I, I've been on a lot of flights. Sounds like you have too. And, you know, there's that part of the flight announcement. And all my friends, you know, they know what I'm going to say. Um, in the unlikely event of a loss of cabin pressure, air masks, something will drop. And what, will you, what, you, what should you do? Secure yourself first. Before helping others. And, you know, the Delta knows something about that. You know, they, like, you know, they want you to be safe. Uh, how are you going to help others if you're passed out or dead or if you're terribly unhealthy or in any state, you know, physically, financially, mentally? Um, and, and sometimes people feel guilty, you know, for putting themselves first. But it's out of obligation to others, you know, to, to be able to help others. You first need to help yourself, you know, get a good night's sleep. You know, I, some, sometimes my employees, you know, they, we work really, really hard. And I'm, I'm proud of all the work they do. You know, you get into those really busy streaks and they take that home and you can tell they're a bit stressed out. And I said, listen, uh, work is important and we do want to get things right. Our clients are incredibly important to us. But if it starts to impede on your health, and you're, you're losing sleep or you're stressed out, 
you need to come to me because that's where you need it, it needs to stop right you need to pause there because you're not doing anyone any favors right uh, so you know put your health above above all else all right get a good night's sleep so eat healthy. Diet. yeah I mean start with the grocery store you know it's not just what you buy but also what you don't what buy do you eat? Yeah, what you don't buy what you don't buy you can't eat you know it's, it's when you have that moment of weakness well, what do you eat God man it's like you know because I, I, I know, I, I know my problem, you know, like potato chips, man, you can, I can't put that bag down. It's hard. It's really hard to put that bag down. So, you know, the decision starts at the grocery store. And I'll tell you something, I, I, someone told me a long time ago and I get, ah, bullshit. I said, hey, listen, it is, it is easier to resist a temptation than to stop once you've gotten started. It's easier to resist than to stop. So... Potato chips, don't even don't buy, them. buy the damn thing. You know, if you have a certain fitness goal, and you know, come on, you know that's not contributing. You know what I mean? You know that consciously, but you yeah, know, just have one, all in moderation. So I eat about forty percent fruit. Yeah. About thirty percent vegetables. All right. About twenty-five percent nuts, and about fifteen percent grain. Okay. What what uh, what percentage potato chips do you eat? <laughs> So I eat chips with my hummus. Because I love the chips. Yeah, yeah. I do pita chips, multigrain, and I do high fiber chips, which they're starting to come out with. Chips that All right, that's cool. promote fiber, right, yeah, yeah. which is like the most necessary. Let's um, dive into your recommendations for Atlanta. Let's talk about places you like to eat, between restaurants, groceries. We'll start with that. Oh man, uh, which one? Groceries. Gro gro groceries? Oh man, well, let's look, I mean, you know, you got the Disco Kroger, there's some history there, right? Uh, so you, you get some, it's, you get some really sketchy characters and some good people watching at the Disco Kroger. Uh, Trader Joe's right next door, the Publix next door, and Aldi just opened up, but you gotta bring your own bags. Absolutely. Bring your own bags to Aldi, Aldi. so I have not been. I like Aldi, you know it's owned by Trader Joe's, right? Yeah, similar history. Yeah. Uh, no, it's the same owners. Family, right? The brothers or something. Yeah. Like identical. Disney or NBC or Comcast own everything. Trader Joe's is. I still fuck with them heavily, though. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Aldi and Trader Joe's. How about restaurants? Yeah. What do you like? What do you like? What are your go-to's? Well, so. Uh, you know, for me, during the week, most of the time, food is just fuel, you know. Food is always just fuel. Uh, well, I mean, it's, for more people, it's become an experience, right? I, I read Some a, people live to eat, I eat to live. Uh, well, you know, I read a stat last week that, um, yeah, the amount of people that are, are you know, the, the eating out rate has increased, you know, like 6% in 2018, and it's up like another 4% this year. I don't believe that. So, um... I, okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt because less and less people leave the house now. Do they? Yes. So. And one of the biggest problems that Carl Atkins, who I was referencing earlier from the Atlanta podcast, who designed these events, is saying the biggest struggle that professional sports and events are going to have in the future is simply getting people out of the fucking house into the place because in-house, in-phone experience is just as good, if not better, subjectively. For these experiences, so you think people, more, more or less people cook now and prepare their own meals than they once did. That's different. You're I think unique. I'm you're, you're a unique. Guy. A different person. You're 100 percent unique, just like all the other seven billion people in the world. Thank you. Yeah. That's that's a really beautiful thing to say. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, make you feel and you can make everybody feel special <laughs> with that. Uh, but no, really, I mean, do you think more or less people prepare their own food when they're, you know, they're stuck in traffic, they come home? Um, um, probably less mm -hmm. because of these diff I mean, eating out, fast food is going to take, what, a third of people, and then real... Well, you know, now you also have the and, delivery services, right? Absolutely, that's the third one so I was going to say. It's kind of a hybrid. Is between delivery service, yeah. meal prep service, anything like that. Yeah. And it's, then just and it's not just all pizza people. being delivered. There, there, there are good choices. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. there's some stuff that like Daily Harvest. Yeah. That's a good one. Have Hello, HelloFresh. Have you used any of those? Yeah. Um, I was 
ambassing fresh and fit cuisine. Okay. A little bit. It's another one. There's like all right. Yeah. Two hundred different locations, pickup spots around it, around Georgia. I haven't tried any yet. You know, I'm I, I'm working during a week, or I'm doing podcasts with uh, wonderful people like you, and then I get home and I'm like, you know what? I just want the hunger to go away. You know, th throw a couple things together, eat, be done, um, do it again tomorrow. Well, that's but, the whole point of these food services, is so you don't have to think about it, right? So you yeah, can just yeah. have the food prepared. So I'll give y'all some insider information. If you've already listened this far through, then you might as well deserve to know. I did not go forward with embassing Fresh and Fit because their food comes in a plastic container with a plastic wrap cover, recommending that you microwave this food in the plastic, which just in itself, asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have really cared. Now, the knowledge that I have in microwaving plastic and what you're ingesting simply from yeah. combining that fucking super high wave of frequency that burns and melts from the inside. This food together with plastic, philosophically, I don't fuck with. I can't yeah. get behind a brand or a company that says, hey, eat your cancer. Yeah. Hey, we'll give you this pretty good food. Some of the food was good. I'm not saying great. Well, but I mean, they obviously have a sustainable plan, and this is the easiest way for the people to, to receive the food. So anything that comes like that, I just can't really get behind. And it's just it's simply just the plastic, the packaging. If they were to change that, it'd be a whole different conversation. I mean, we, you know, we're, we're a giant social experiment right now, right? The food companies are trying on us. The, you know, uh, we are a social experiment, what? and we are our data which is our it's, most precious and prime thing. And a point that I really want people to walk away with from this is you are your data, and that is the most precious thing that we have. Yeah, your DNA, I mean, it's all data, right? Uh, I'm a marketing guy, so I love marketing, you know? I love advertising, uh, and, and the history of it is fascinating. You know, if you go to Google, one of the fun, most, maybe I'm weird, no, I'm definitely weird, but a fun thing to do, okay? Um, go to Google Images and just type in 1960s advertisements, funny advertisements, 1960s, 1950s. You'll be shocked at some other stuff that comes up. So I just hosted this guy, Bob Place. Sorry to interrupt, but to piggyback on what you're saying. And he had me go and watch some 1960s cigarettes. Commercials. What did you think? Um, and I hadn't really seen anything about that in a, in, in a while. Yeah. And it blew my mind. Yeah. I cannot believe they got away with advertising like that. I mean, you know, in the 60s, they discovered that the smokes might be kind of bad for you. But look how long it's taken for, you know, for us to get to the point where, yeah, uh, you don't have to be subject to smoke at a restaurant anymore. You know what I mean? It's taken a lot of time, man. It's taken it's an entire places you can't. <laughs> generation of people, right? Of dying off. Yeah, I mean, exactly, right? I mean, the hardcore, you know, uh, fanatics, you know, just have to die off, you know, for a new generation to come in and say, this just doesn't make any sense. Are you kidding me? How do you feel about that? About that generational lapse? Or uh, man, you know, uh, you, you know, we're, we're, we're living longer, supposedly, right? Not necessarily better. You know, the saying, you know, it's not the years in your life, but the life in your years. And do you mm -hmm. want to really be 120 years old, but be completely bed bedridden and unhealthy or be on tubes? I, I don't know about you, that's not quality of life to me, right? So, but, you know, let, let's just hypothetically say for a moment that, you know, instead of the average age of 84, which is about the average age for a male in the U.S., let's just hypothetically say it's 300, you know? Or more, three, four hundred years is the average age. It, would that really be good, or would it be bad? Right to your question, is it? It takes an entire generation of people to die off to let go of some of these old habits and some of these terrible beliefs that we had. That you know that the people just hold on to because they're ingrained. You know, it becomes habit forming. So you know, we we suddenly, you know, we no longer believe what we see. We see what we believe. Mm. We, we are projecting our own, th our own beliefs on the world, right? So when is art imitating life and when is life imitating art? You know, when do our beliefs change the world, right? 
in a, now, in some ways, if we were around individually three, four hundred years, if that was the average lifespan, whoa, we'd have some very, very, very old beliefs. You know, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. But if you look at these 1960 commercials or ads, you know, that that promote 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 alcohol for pregnant women, um, promote cocaine tooth drops, you know, to ease the, the ease the pain. Oh, and give some of the Paps beer to the to the you know to the infant because it'll you know it'll ease their pain of teething. Of course, it'll do other things. It'll knock them out real good, you know. But that, I mean, that was just accepted. It was the norm back then. Now we look at that and say, you know, you see these camel cigarette ads with doctors. Uh, more, you know, nine out of ten doctors recommend this cigarette over that because of whatever. Right? I mean, it's absurd. Now we can look at it. It's completely absurd. Okay. Because we're looking at this from a distance. We're able to zoom out, you know, and get better perspective and say, okay, now we can look at these old ideas and say they're completely absurd. So the challenge, of course, now is trying to try to imagine, David, project 20, 30, 40 years into the future. Imagine the world, what, what it might be like then, and some of the things that the future version of you, okay, David, it's called David plus 40, is going to look back at and say, man, that was absurd, right? And j just in society, I can't believe we did that. It's, so, it's common sense now. Why would anyone do that, right? And, and, and I think it's as funny as it is, it's mind expanding to look at old advertisements because they were very well crafted, very well sold. They were very effective. And, um, you know, they didn't just change what people wanted to change their whole idea of what was right and wrong. You know, belief from in their systems. Suddenly, wearing hats went out of style. You know, every man, rich man, poor man, you know, most of them took the buses and the subways, you know, New York City. Everyone read the newspaper, right? Now we get criticized. You know, you've seen the artists' renderings of, like, you know, people on their phones. They take the phone away. Oh, what a poor society. What a... What a bad society we are for looking at our screens the way we do. It's disconnecting us. And so, you know, you've seen that perspective. And I appreciate the perspective. But again, if you look at society in the 1950s and 60s, you'd see 200 people, 100 people on a, on a bus or, in, or, or in a, on a train or on a train station. Everyone's reading the New York Times or the Chicago. Everyone's in the newspaper. Now, so instead, of, instead of people reading, you know, the news on their phones, they're out reading the newspaper. Still not talking to one another. Didn't, didn't, you know, didn't change anything. Um, so I think we're a little bit, in some ways, we're a little bit too hard on ourselves. Oh, we're so disconnected from society because we're on these devices. Is that the issue? It's really just, you know, the mechanism or the device or the technology. So maybe in the future, you know, we, we probably won't have this device in our hands. Maybe it would be a holographic projection, you know, from, from glasses or a contact or something. But we're still going to be paying attention and communicating with people. It's innate, you know. Human nature has never really changed. A lot of people ask me, especially when I, you know, we're interviewing a lot of people at AIS Media right now for new positions. And, you know, I like to ask people, hey, what questions do you have for me? And one of the most common questions is, you know, of course, hey, how did you start the company and why? And where do you think this is going? You know, where, where, where do you see things in the next three to five to ten years, right? And it's a very good question for applicants to ask because they want, they're also asking, where am I going to be? You know, what, what should I expect? And, so what's the um, answer? Well, the answer is this, you know, uh, quoting Mark Twain here, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So the past is a good indication of the future. And technology changes, right? In my company, you know, we didn't always use social media because Facebook's only about 13 years old, right? We've been in business longer than that. So we evolved and we changed the way we communicate. Um, email wasn't always an acceptable thing. At one point, you know, mass email and email marketing was kind of evil. It was kind of a naughty thing to do or spam, you know. It's just normal now. Um, just, so a lot of things that we do today that we use, tools we use and techniques that we use, they weren't always acceptable. But, you know, I have a 14-year-old niece. She doesn't know a world without the Internet. She's on her phone because that's what she does. Um, my, my mother... You know, for the longest time, she was anti-computers. And a few years ago, for Christmas, I bought her an iPad. And she looked at it and she said, Thomas, German lady, you know, why, why would you buy me a computer? What am I going to do with a computer, you know? Uh, I, 
She was so confused by it, almost disgusted by it. Why would you buy me this, you know? Earrings she could understand, perfume she always wanted, why? I spent a couple weeks, you know, with her in New Jersey. By the end of the first week, David, she was on that iPad. She wouldn't get off the iPad. She is still to this day on that iPad. You know how I know she's on the iPad? I can get on Facebook. She doesn't know. She, she's not watching. She doesn't know that I know that she's on playing Info. bingo. Static. Because she's, you know, because we're friends and, you know. Right. Says, oh, you know, your close friends, they're she's on playing bingo right on the Facebook game. Bingo! She's on bingo. She won't take my call. Oh, I was busy. I was busy. I wasn't around. I'm like, yeah, I know. You were, you were busy with your bingo. You know? <laughs> um, now she won't get off the iPad, right? She used to give me a hard time for being on my phone all the time while I was up there. I'm like, Mama, she goes, stop, stop bullshitting around, you know? You're, you're bullshitting with your friends. I said, you know, I understand. I check my work email. I check work social media. You know, I check the news. I check stocks. I read news. Everything on this device, okay? You're sitting here watching CNN and the price is right. You're less productive than I am. Okay, during a commercial break, yes. what are you doing? You're watching commercials. I'm reading my email, I'm placing orders, I'm answering customer service requests, you know, stuff that gets forwarded to me. I feel a lot more productive than you are watching these commercials. Now she's on her iPad? Oh, can't get through to her. So that's how quickly we can change, right? But my niece is born into a world only with internet, right? So it's, um, it's How exciting. long until we have devices implanted in our bodies? Well, they're already implanted um, in our bodies, right? We have pacemakers, we have, uh, you know, all, all kinds of medical devices that are optional, right, that are keeping us alive longer. Very well answered. How long until we have these media communication cell phones? Well, I mean, in our bodies. And, and so by me, do you mean as, as, as a human race or us as Americans? Us as Americans. Well, that's subject to FDA approval, but if you go to Australia, they're already legal. If you go to Europe, parts of Europe, they're optional, but there, there's a whole, there are tens of thousands of people who've already opted in and had these little devices implanted in their, in their arms that open doors, help them, let them, you know, pay for things, unlock, you know, certain access levels in their companies. It's a little chip that's it, just shot into your wrist and, okay. you know, I mean, if that were available, it's not FDA approved yet, but in the U.S., but if it was available to you, you know, would you? And if so, how, let's say, how opposed to it would you be, is the question. Now, if, if it was a government mandate that everyone had one, of course we'd revolt, we'd, you know, we would march, man. We would set shit on fire. We would set businesses on fire, because that's the thing to do when you disagree with things, right? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But, but if it's optional, people are gonna opt in, right? If the government made you check into Starbucks, made you post your, pictures, you know, every time you went out, say, hell no, I'm not doing that. I would revolt. Sounds my freedom, like my freedoms are imposed, you know, uh, imposed one. But if it's optional, we, we opt into it, right? So, um, yeah, it's coming and it's coming real soon. And, um, you know, right now, I, you know, I see I, you, you wear a very nice watch. I think I'm going to buy one this weekend because the phone in the gym, you know. Um, but, but, but look, it, it's got a, uh, it's got sensors already built into it, right? To keep, keep track of your heart rate and your rhythms and your sleep and so forth. You know, it's game and life changing. Uh, we are, you know, we have some clients in healthcare and life science, and I can't get into details, but I've seen, I've had the privilege of being in some of these conferences that are just so incredibly thought provoking of, of what's to come. And I, I can say with confidence, without naming any you know, manufacturers, we're very, very, very close having a device that pairs with that phone that's inside your body that's going to take the capabilities of that thing to the moon. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, wouldn't, how, how helpful. Now you would say, oh, a device in my body, I don't like that idea, you know, I'm going to be spied upon. But you're a healthy guy. How helpful would it be if that device kept track of your cholesterol level? If it kept track of your, you know, not just your heart rate, but, you know, your platelet count, your oxygen level in your body. Um, you know, if you're a diabetic and say, hey, your insulin level's dropping, you know, you, you know you, enough of that sugar dessert, you know, you, you've reached your max, right? If it actually kept track of your magnesium levels, it told you, I, you need to take that vitamin. Send you notification saying don't or do. But man, right. you know, it's like, that's your last drink anymore. You're going to get sick. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, we won't just get pulled over and get a ticket, but you'll literally suffer from a terrible hang up to, uh, hangover tomorrow unless 
You take a little magnesium pill or something. You know, if it actually interacted, now that's helpful. If you're, if you're providing things that in, improve our quality of life. Finishing up, I'll call you. There you go. I'm, I'm here. Just wait. <laughs> so, you know, so that's where, I mean, that's where we're going with this stuff. Um, and we are very, very close to getting there. So, a very, very long answer to your question earlier. You know, where are we going in the future? Leaps and bounds, right? 5G technology is going to, it's going to be unbelievable where we're going to be in the next 10 to 15 years. But however, some things will absolutely never change because they never have. I mean, if you go back hundreds of years and say, well, what did people want 200 years ago, 100 years ago, 50 years ago? Did people value uh, personal security to feel safe? Did people value not going to bed hungry? Did they value good health? You know, did they value you know, financial freedom and, and financial security? Did they value happiness? You know, did they value getting from point A to point B faster, better, right? We all, you know, did they value a good deal? How long have people been negotiating for a better deal? Furs, you know, better deal on salt, better deal on gold, you know, better deal on food. We always want things faster, cheaper, more efficiently. Those are innate human needs. Now, how we get to those things? Maybe it's an app. Maybe it's a device. Maybe it's a, yeah, maybe it's a rocket. Okay, um, where we go on vacation may change, but we always want a vacation. Some things are never going to change. So in that regard, if you understand human needs, it becomes easier to predict you know, what might be extremely successful and what's probably gonna flop. You know? mm. What's one thing that you're versed on that you feel the general population needs to know better of? In what sense? In the topic was? Let's uh, say, I mean, we have overall productivity, life, love, happiness. Yeah, I think the, uh, we, everyone, if you say to someone, look, do you, do you like the idea, the idea of world peace, you know, people just not killing each other for, for stupid stuff. Sure, you know, do you like the idea of that, you know, just us all getting along better and, you know, how do you get there? And uh, it's, I, I, I think that the cure, the potential cure, lies in education, right? And it starts when you're young. And it, it never ends, it should never end. Uh, it's the only hope we have, right? Life doesn't get any easier. In fact, it gets harder. You know, we, we think life was hard when you were seven, eight, nine, you know, maybe you were bullied, maybe you got your ass kicked by this guy, maybe you were stressed out over a book report that was due. You were stressed out over things all the time. But now you look back and say, that was nothing. You thought that was bad, what about today? Um, so life becomes harder and harder and more complicated. The only chance we have at mastering it is that we also become better, faster, stronger, smarter, right? So it's education, isn't it? And learning from our mistakes. Um, and I think the more people travel, the more people get to know other cultures, other races, other beliefs, you know, other religions, um, you know, but the more open-minded we become. And the more we learn, the more we discover how little we do know, and it's humbling. And the minute you discover just how little you actually know, and I think it, uh, it helps you go into a room and say, you know, I'm ignorant. What can I learn here? You know, and if you approach a situation from that perspective, uh, I, I think we're, we're, you know, we're going to become better people because uh, the, worst, the worst of all are the know-it-alls. Right, Facts. and and when we're young, you know, we're it, it's like oh, we're about to a enter the age of infinite wisdom. We know everything, you know. When you're 12, 13, 14, you can't. No one can tell you anything. You know it all, right? Uh, until you discover how little you know, and uh, I think that comes with age. It comes with maturity. It comes with failure. It comes with mistakes. Those are humbling. You know, we, we need to have our asses kicked. You know, we need to we need to fail, and we need to fail hard, and we need to fail fast, and we need to fail frequently. And when do we do? Um, it's both humbling and it's, I, I think, encouraging at the same time because sometimes some people are so afraid of failure that they never even try anything. But if, if you imagine yourself past that failure, you know, maybe you're afraid of getting knocked out, you know, maybe you're afraid of being humiliated, um, 
you know, I practiced a little public speaking at Toastmasters when I first moved to Atlanta, and the stat was that uh, there are more people afraid of public speaking than they are afraid of dying. And I said to that, I'm like, well, maybe it's not the speaking they're, they're afraid of, it's the fear of failure and humiliation and people laughing at them and ridiculing them, you know? Um, Chris Rock did a, a skit on that. You know, it's, it's, it's a good interview to watch. But it's, a, it, it's uh, and the joke about it was that, well, if more people are afraid of speaking than death, it means at a funeral more people would prefer to be in a casket than be giving the eulogy. You know, it's, the, it's that fear of failure. But go ahead and fail. And, and you know, get yourself your laughed shot. at, man. Get, get humiliated, fall down, and then realize, man, I'm still good. I'm still alive. You know, I made an ass out of myself. I misspoke. I was unprepared. What, what's that going to do? It's going to teach you a lesson, right? How do I get better at it next time? Because I'm going to fail again. But it's how you handle the failure, right? Like I think Mike Tyson said, you know, oh, it's like everyone's got a plan it. until you get punched in the face, <laughs> right? True. So I think it's a pretty good time to wrap up. Yeah. Why don't you tell everybody where they can find you online? Well, uh, you can find me on Facebook. That's a it's a good place to start. You know, Thomas Harpointner. Harpointner. <laughs> but um, on Instagram, I'm also Thomas Harpointer, but my Instagram handle is zoom out 104. Look at the big picture, you know, zoom out 10-4. Um, Bubbles Benefit, the, the charity event that we set up, Bubbles Benefit, it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram. It's got an Instagram profile, yeah, yeah just my, my, it my, my team set up a Twitter profile too now. I think we're, we're going to try to do a lot more with that brand because we're getting a lot of people behind it, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, my company, AIS Media, you know, we're, of course, all over the internet, so you can find us there. So, um, but no, I really appreciate this. This was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Hopefully, we can do it yeah, again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, David. I look forward to promoting the Bubbles Benefit and being there myself. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. Absolutely.